So um, by background, anesthesiologist, I'm an intensivist. I'm on right now at Shock Trauma Center. I uh, medical direct our, our largest ICU, which is Five South, which I'd encourage you guys to spend some time if you ever want to going forward, come in round with us. We'll, we'll take you through, do a lot of ultrasound, cool stuff, um, maybe some airways. So that, those are all opportunities I want to offer you. Right now I'm down at Andrews as a reservist, not doing the fun stuff like you guys are. But um, I would say that uh, just before I start here, if there's anybody you're going to take and pick from the community, it's going to have to be one of you guys that, that could do this stuff. Um, so if we, if the, you know, when the balloon goes up and we start populating the Javits Center and our convention center here, uh, you know, this is going to be a tough push, but I'm pretty confident that you guys are used to working with far less in a lot of cases. So it is feasible. And I think that hopefully this is one step forward in terms of improving your knowledge and getting ready for this in case it happens. We're not going to be able to cover mechanical ventilation in 30 minutes, but I'm going to go through some basic modes. I don't have any disclosures in terms of I'm not, I don't have any relation to any of the products that I, if I talk about, I'm a co-author on in a book that I get nothing for. Um, so here we go. Four different modes. Let's go through those. Let's talk about some advantages, disadvantages. Just get some of the nomenclature down. And then I'll, I'll walk you through how you can actually create, that's double, I'm sorry, I had to modify these at the last second. There's, there might be a couple minor errors there. We're going to talk about initiating orders for mechanical ventilation. And then importantly, talking about some of the troubleshooting that we do for this. So um, again, before I get really into this, here in Maryland, being involved with Maryland State Police Aviation Command, we put vents on the helicopters well over a year ago. Uh, I don't know what we're up to. We're probably we're well over. I think I think it's over a hundred. Any of my MSP colleagues are on the line. They'll they'll tell that. But um, we trained those folks at the National Registry paramedic level to be vent competent in a very short time. It started with a very similar lecture. In fact, many of the slides you're going to see today are what we used to start training them. But to really get good at this, you got to get hands on. So I can talk till I'm blue in the face. This is a good intro. I'll go fairly quickly through this, but to really get good at this, maybe we can advance this in terms of, you know, actually doing some vent sim. And I'll share some of that with you at the very end of this. All right, basics, couple definitions, tidal volume. So this is one of the most important things. You can really hurt somebody with a ventilator. And in fact, you can kill a patient if you put them on a ventilator, you really can. You, you can really box them quick if you're not careful. One of the things to be careful about in the evidence base, some of which I'll share with you in a little bit here, really has to do with the predicted body weight. So you have to measure the patient's height. I have a thing on my cell phone that I can just, you guys may have laser, you can use a tape measure, but you gotta get a height. And a lot of us carry cards on our ID badge or whatnot, and you can actually just determine what their tidal volume should be. That's one of the most important things to plug in initially, because you don't wanna pop their lungs and cause barotrauma and volume trauma. So really important to get the tidal volume right. It's based off of height. It makes sense. If you've got a six foot five dude, you're not gonna wanna, um, they're gonna require more tidal volume. We're gonna have bigger lungs. But if you've got a 300 pound patient who's only four foot two, you do not wanna be blasting 10 mils per kg into those lungs. So you'll hurt that patient. So that's the first foot stopper is tidal volume. Six to eight mils per kg, you'll never go wrong. Predicted body weight, i.e. ideal body weight. Couple other definitions real quickly. Minute ventilation we talk about, that's a really good, um, that's a good one where we talk about just tidal volume and respiratory rate. You know, we want that to be something we monitor. Uh, I won't get too much into that. These are just some, some terms to be familiar with. Alveolar ventilation is the amount of gas getting to the alveoli. And then you start talking about things like, probably most importantly, physiologic dead space. This is an important one when we get to ARDS and COVID because that's the problem, is they have a lot of dead space. They're, these are non-participatory segments of the lung that are not eliminating CO2 and not absorbing oxygen. So physiologic dead space is a problem. Normally, young patients do not have much physiologic dead space. It's a tremendous reserve in the lungs, but when you get disease, that's what happens. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. So let's go through what actually happens. When you put somebody on mechanical ventilation, it's actually a fairly significant physiologic event. You're, you're reversing all their physiology. That's what basically you're doing. You're putting positive pressure on, you're expanding the alveoli, and you're pushing the chest wall outwards. And importantly, 
the pleural pressure becomes positive. So normally as we breathe right now, negative. So you're reversing the physiology, just remember that. That has a lot of consequences. This is from our FCCS course, which by the way, at the very end of this lecture, I'm gonna give you guys a link where you can go to one-stop shopping and download any of the slides from the Fundamentals of Critical Care Support course. You can go right in, I just left the mechanical ventilation ones there. This is out of there. So when you inspire, you see, you wind up with this positive airway pressure. There's something that triggers this to happen. Usually it's the patient trying to take a breath or if it's time cycled, you tell the ventilator, okay, I want this, you to give a breath every 12 times a minute, 20 times a minute. That ventilator will do exactly like you tell it to, okay? So the trigger could, or it could be, you set the ventilator up to say, hey, I don't want you to give a breath until this patient wants to take a breath and they're trying to. Then we're gonna support them with that breath. So triggering, lots of things that can trigger. That's what, this is what defines the modes we're about to talk about. Then it cycles, something shuts that breath off. It's not just a valve that's gonna continually, it's not CPAP necessarily. We wanna limit the amount that we're pushing in with positive pressure and then give the lungs a chance to expire. And that's what, something has to be triggered there to cycle this breath through and have the patient expire. This is the basic waveform you're gonna see with any form of mechanical ventilation, the respiratory cycle, okay? It's positive pressure, inspiration, expiration. Give the patient some indication to start that process, whether they trigger it or you decide to, and something to shut that inspiratory effort down to let them exhale, okay? Here, this goes back to that picture. I just did a quick picture I wanted to show you here. Oh, there we go. So inspiration, expiration, complete reversal. Complete reversal, normally you are slightly negative both in the alveolar level, your pleural level, and this all gets reversed when we put patients on positive pressure. We have to do it, we don't have a choice. They're in respiratory failure. They can't do this normal process themselves. So we have to take it over and we take it over with a process that reverses all of this. In a subsequent talk, which you will have a link to at the end of this, I talk about the hemodynamic consequences of doing this, one of which is you can make them very hypotensive. So it's not your drugs you're giving necessarily to intubate them. You might do a really good job picking the right drugs, but the process of positive pressure, this transition can shut off their IVC and decrease their preload. They get, get profoundly hypovolemic. I think this is missed a lot when we put people on. So something to be aware of, whole separate talk, but the process is um, a complete reversal of our normal physiology. So once again, something has to trigger your breath. It's usually a drop in the airway pressure. So if the patient decides they wanna take a breath, in that tubing of the ventilator, it detects that pressure change. So when they start to breathe in, they're not strong enough to get their own breath. That drop in pressure triggers the ventilator to say, okay, time for action. I'm gonna put a breath in. And then the cycling is what turns that breath off and lets the lungs exhale passively, okay? Gas delivery, we'll talk about, this is what governs the gas flow. It's the flow of the gas, the oxygen, air, uh, air mixture, you're gonna have pressure, we'll talk about that. Let's get right into four modes. These are the four most common modes. By the way, I'm not gonna talk about advanced crap like APRV, which many of you may have heard about. We can go there if you want. And actually, it's one of the modes they're recommending for this COVID stuff. Um, we haven't had to use it. Actually, I should take that back. We are using it right now in one of our ECMO patients. So if you want a separate thing on this, no problem. We'll get there. But that's really cart before the horse. Let's get to the basics first. Let's talk about the four basic modes. Then we can get into advanced stuff if you guys want later. Okay. So here's, I list, um, I list five modes, but they're really very similar, as you'll see. So there's really only four and, and there's overlap. Remember with all of our conventional ventilators nowadays, our contemporary ventilators rather, there's a lot of overlap with these modes. Some can do a pressure mode, but have elements that control volume. So some of this terminology gets confusing, but just break it down by the essentials. And that's what I'll try to do here for you. So assist control, let's start with the most, honestly, this is the most aggressive mode. This is where you are telling the ventilator, okay, I want you to deliver 500 mils, 12 times a minute, I want expiratory pressure, peak, peak, uh, 
I want a positive end expiratory pressure PEEP of five and an FiO2 of whatever you set. That ventilator will do that. It will try to do that. It doesn't care about pressure limits. There's some built in, but this mode is the most primitive mode, but it's also the mode we use when someone's really sick. So this is gonna deliver exactly the volume you want to deliver. You program in your predicted body weight, you've measured the patient, you've determined what type tidal volume you want, and the ventilator is gonna do it. Where it's confusing is you see this word assist here. That's really not how this is used. Um, you, can, you can allow the patient to breathe, and I'll show you a picture in just a second that explains this. But I really would, in the, in the old days, we used to call this mode continuous mechanical ventilation, okay? Simple, um, the patient doesn't really, is fully rested. Most of these patients are gonna be on heavy duty sedation, maybe paralyzed. If you're proning a patient, this is a mode oftentimes we'll use. The problem is it's not comfortable. If I were to take any of you and, and put you on this mode, you wouldn't like it because it's gonna, it's gonna breathe 12 times a minute and you may not wanna breathe at that 12 times a minute. You may wanna breathe in between. And when you try to breathe on top of a breath the ventilator's giving you, it could stack your breaths. So it's not a comfortable mode. Um, and so the problem is if someone's not sedated, they can get very dyssynchronous on this mode because it's uncomfortable. You are basically telling the patient exactly what you want them to do with this mode. It's the most simple mode, okay? Continuous mechanical ventilation. It's not comfortable. Here's how it works. So these are the pressure, your pressures on the y-axis. Whenever you see a ventilator waveform, do not freak out. Do not freak out. Look at the y-axis, look at the x-axis. If it's progressing, it's always gonna be time, even if it's not labeled. So in this case, we have a pressure and a time axis. We have a volume and a time axis. This is the volume going into the lungs. That's the milliliters you program that ventilator to do. The pressure is how much pressure is required to do that, something we want to monitor. We'll talk about that in other modes in just a minute. And so if you set this up perfectly, you could time this so when the patient says, okay, oh, I want a breath, bam, ventilator kicks in, it gives a very blunt square waveform. See that? It's a very primitive waveform. It's square, nothing cosmic about this. And in the fact of when they're paralyzed or heavily sedated, they're not, going to be, they're not going to be taking any breaths. They're just going to be getting a breath every whatever you program the ventilator to do. Do you see that? There's no triggering here. This is a patient who's sedated. You're targeting a tidal volume that you want them to get. You're telling the ventilator how often to give it. That's assist control. Common mode for really bad ARDS because these patients are so sick. If they try to breathe, they'll be to Kipnik. They'll breathe in the 40s, and they won't. they'll stack their breaths. So what we'll usually do is we'll sedate them, oftentimes paralyze them, and then put them on this mode and we take over everything, okay? So that's what this mode is. Next, SIMB. You may or may not be using this, but it's another confusing term. It's the, it was really developed as a partial ventilatory mode. We use this a lot in surgical patients because the way this works is, think of it as just like assist control, like I just showed you, only the difference is Maybe you, the patient does want to take a breath in between every now and then. Well, guess what? We can let them do that, and we can help them. We can give them some support. We can give them some pressure support in between. So we like this for surgical patients because they go through their surgery. They're getting better. We want to wean them off the ventilator. So what we do is we just dial down the rate of how many mandatory breaths we're giving, and then they breathe in between. We see how they're doing. We continue to decrease the mandatory breaths allow them to do more spontaneous, and then we get right to pressure support, which I'll talk about. So this is a way you can wean patients that you expect to get better. Most of our ARDS patients and COVID patients, you're not gonna be on this mode right away. So I'll show it to you for completeness sake, but this is how it works. See that waveform? Very similar to assist control. The only difference is now in between breaths, we have, so we have our mandatory breaths, that's the MV in this mode, but intermittently, the patient may say, hey, I want to take a breath, but I'm not due for one for a couple more seconds. Okay, we'll let you take a breath. We'll give you some pressure support. For those of you guys that have flown an aircraft, this is like your, your um, combat edge, your, your mask that you wear in the aircraft. For those of you guys, you guys have done this, I'm sure, when you do your high altitude stuff. You know what positive pressure feels like, right? That's the same concept here. That's exactly what it feels like, too, by the way, on the mask. CPAP. 
mask, BiPAP mask, that's what you're getting in between. You're getting a, a supported breath. It's not a complete breath. It could be, but it's just a partial breath. And then the, the mandatory breath kicks in and gives you what you want. So that's SIMB, and they, sometimes you'll see this SIMB plus pressure support. It's really all SIMB. Synchronous intermittent mandatory ventilation, okay? The way you set this up is you, you I'm going to go through orders in just a second here, but you put your positive end expiratory pressure. I'm going to argue to you that almost every patient, especially our COVID patients, they are going to need some PEEP. PEEP is the back pressure. That's the back pressure in between breaths that keeps their airway stented open. Keeps their airway stented open. So starting with five or 10 of PEEP is not the wrong answer for most patients. We'll talk about that in a minute. Put your rate in. Our usual respiratory rate is around 12 to 16. You adjust it based off of acid base and end tidal CO2. I'm gonna show you a way to do that in just a minute. Tidal volume, like we talked about, based on their height, predicted body weight. And then your pressure support breath program in like 20 centimeters of water and work your way down, see how their lungs are. If their lungs are starting to recover, they're not gonna need a lot of pressure to open up. Um, you can just give them the supported breaths in between, okay? These are some things you can do to adjust it. If they're really breathing fast, the answer most of the time is they need more sedation, okay? That's the answer. Um, if you paralyze them, that's fine. We're not afraid to paralyze these patients. Where I work in the lung rescue unit, the ECMO unit, um, that's what we do with these patients when they come in. They're that sick. They have no lung that's participating. We put them on ECMO and we still ventilate them a little bit, but we usually have to paralyze them because they're if, they, if they're not paralyzed, their diaphragm will try to breathe for them. So you got to really think about sedation when you're doing all this stuff because that's a really important piece of all this. Separate talk, but um, important piece. So pros and cons. This is a good mode. It's not an automatic mode. You're not going to automatically wean off the ventilator if you're getting better. You have to dial that rate down so that those mandatory breaths stop being so as much as frequent. You have to, um, you can easily adjust the pressure support for, for modes. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, in between, if you want them to have some supportive breaths. But I think the important thing is here, it's if, you're, if you've got a really sick patient and you put them on this mode, it's basically going to be exactly like the previous mode I showed you, that continuous mechanical ventilation. Okay? Because if they're that sick, they're not going to want to do a lot of spontaneous breathing if you should be sedating them, so they're not trying to do that and you're giving them a nice, regular, positive pressure ventilation, okay? Pressure control, okay. So what if we've got a patient we're bagging, we just tubed them, and it's hard to bag them. And I will tell you that some of these, so what we're hearing from Italy mostly, and other places, we're hearing from Korea, some from China, hard to get the right information all the time, but I, I can tell you from our reliable places that are similar to us, the COVID patients actually have really good compliance. So what I mean by that is, you know what that means. After you tube someone, the bag's nice and easy. The lungs are nice and compliant, in and out. They're not real stiff where you're like, wow, I'm really, I'm really struggling here, you know? So, um, but if you do have a problem where your lungs are not compliant and they're getting really diseased quickly, and we do see, we will see that in the end stage of ARDS and COVID, you're, you may have problems where you may want to tell the ventilator, look, I do not want you to deliver a pressure above 30. Because if you do that, you're going to be trying to crank a high pressure into a lung that doesn't, can't take that pressure. It'll explode, literally. Parts of the lung will explode and you'll wind up with a pneumothorax or barotrauma. So what you can do is you can use this mode called pressure control and you can say, all right, I'm, not, I'm worried about my tidal volume. There's a tidal volume I want to achieve but I'm gonna control that by dialing in the pressure, watch the ventilator, and see if that pressure helps me achieve the tidal volume. So your breath is controlled by the pressure that you dial in, not the volume. And so that's why you gotta be careful if you're using this a little more advanced of a mode. I wouldn't recommend this right off the bat unless you're doing it with getting some hands on with it. Because the problem is if their lung is, gets better and you dial the wrong pressure and you can, again, you can cause damage to their lung because you're gonna be putting weight too much pressure in. This is a mode where we want to be really careful about a concept called plateau pressure, which, which I'll get to, okay? So we use this, but you got to make sure the patient's sedated, and you got to really be watching them carefully. I would argue that if you're doing this in a negative pressure environment like we're doing now here at Shock Trauma, we've got 
three patients that are on ECMO as of today. We've got nine other rule outs. I'm just getting, I just got called before this for three more that are coming through. I tubed one yesterday. So we're starting to see the numbers. We're not as bad as New York, you guys, in New York, but, um, or some of our other friends elsewhere. But the point is, we're using pressure control as the initial vent mode of, of choice a lot of times because we're only really careful with giving this patients too much pressure. But you gotta watch them carefully. And the problem is if they're in a room that's negative pressure, you can't do that very easily because then it means you gotta go in and out of the room over and over. So we're struggling with this. We're bringing the vent outside the room, which is a great move. I would, I would argue if you can do that, great. You can just extend the, the tubing, the vent tubing. That's one technique to, to keep your eyes on this. Then you have a hybrid mode here. The last one I'll the second to last one I'll talk about, pressure regulated volume control. So if you wanted to have the best of both worlds, you're, you're saying to the ventilator, okay, I want a tidal volume of say 500 mils, but I do not want you to go above 30, mil, 30 centimeters of water. I do not want you to give more pressure because I just want the exact tidal volume and I don't want the pressure that goes with it. The ventilator will try to do this. It'll adjust the flow to give you your target tidal volume, but it won't exceed the pressure. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. There's not a lot of disadvantages except, except that the patient, if they're really, really sick, this is not a good mode. You should go right to assist control and give them a very controlled breath, okay? But if they're kind of in between, they're, they're sick, we intubated them early, you could use breath, 22. Let's go up a little bit. Let's dial it up a little. The ventilator does this for you automatically. And by the way, if the lungs are getting better, it also dials the pressure down. So it can kind of almost automatically adjust to an improving lung. And then finally, you see it ramps itself up and you get to this target tidal volume and the ventilator says, okay, this patient needs about 27 of pressure to get to the target tidal volume. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to continue to watch this. The ventilator will do that for you. Here's the other nice thing about PRVC. And by the way, most of our transport ventilators can't do this. So to back up, assist control, if that's what you gotta do, okay? But if you do have the option to do something a little more sophisticated, I, I shouldn't say that, the more, if any of you guys are using the Hamilton, Hamiltons or anything more advanced, this, this mode, you can do a similar mode to this on that, mode, on that ventilator, okay? But the nice thing we like about this from the intensive care is look at that waveform. It's not a box primitive waveform. It goes up and it rapidly decelerates and it adjusts the waveform and sculpts it so that you're not just giving a square positive pressure waveform every time. So this is an adjustable mode, a self-adjusting mode that we really like. Last is pressure support. So now the patient's better. All we need is to give them a little bit of pressure to overcome resistance of that tube and it just helped give them a little bit of support. So in other words, when they take a breath, this is like your mask you've got on. It's giving them a little bit of pressure through the tube, a little bit just to help them support them. As they get better, they shouldn't need any pressure support. So when we get down to a level of like five of pressure support, they're ready to come off the vent. That's, that's a, that is an extubation criteria right there, okay? You can add in CPAP or PEEP, whatever term you wanna use. We use, we actually, and that can actually help you, so you keep the back pressure, and then when you add in the pressure support, they take a breath, and then the back pressure is just the peep that's left in the circuit to keep that circuit charged with a pressure so that their lungs don't do this and collapse. Okay, how are we doing for those five modes? Want me to stop here or keep going? I, I threw a lot at you. Uh, this is stuff you'll have to probably go back and take a look at. I, this all comes together with hands-on practice. Hey Sam, what? sir, can you just verbally say each mode and the one sentence bullet as to what they are as a review? You for got us, it. Please. Great. So assist control, continuous mechanical ventilation, most aggressive. Uh, what you plug in is what the patient gets. SIMV, very similar to assist control, only now we add some breaths in between. We support the patient if they want to breathe in between. Pressure control, all pressure. We're dialing in the pressure to the ventilator. Hopefully it gets us to the tidal volume we, we want. It's for patients where we're worried about a really stiff lung. PRVC, pressure regulated volume control, best of both worlds. You control the pressure limit, 
but you tell the ventilator what title volume you want him to give. Pressure support, just a little bit of pressure to overcome that resistance of the tube and to help them breathe a little bit easier. Think of that as your, again, combat edge, your, your positive pressure mask you've got when you're breathing in. You know that feeling of getting a little bit of air pushed in under pressure. That's all it is. It's a little bit of support. It's, it's really your, the patient is doing 90% of the work with pressure support. Perfect. Continue. Thank Good. you. Okay. Let's talk about management. So when you, when you go to set up your ventilator, you're going to have a lot of knobs and don't be intimidated. There's only a few things you can ma really manipulate. Even at the highest levels of this critical care business, there's only a few things we can manipulate, you know, uh, and these, this is really it. So you start with your FiO2. That's going to be 100% FiO2. That's your oxygen concentration going into the vent. You start with 100 and work your way down. And you can do that off of pulse ox. You can do that off of arterial blood gases. But that's where you start, OK? This is not the time to worry about hyperoxia with these patients. What we're seeing with the COVID patients are, you guys have read this, they're profoundly hypoxemic to start. So if I'm going to intubate someone and put them on the vent, they're getting 100% FiO2 until I get that first ABG back, okay? Then I'll back off the FiO2. So 100% to start. Tidal volume, we talked about this. Now here's the formulas. I would encourage you to have either a card if you're doing this or just do it on your phone. I, in you know, the world of critical care exams, we have to know these formulas. I would not encourage you to memorize. I think you guys have enough crap to memorize. But just remember, it is based off of height. Use your phone, use a laser ruler, use a ruler, tape measure, but you gotta get the height right because that is a critical aspect of this. And then it's really simple. Six to eight mils per kilogram is your tidal volume. PEEP, that's your end expiratory pressure. We start that at five. That's, you're never gonna be wrong to start at five. It, it's wrong to start at zero, and I'll show you a couple things in a second here on that. You can add in pressure support if you want. That's advanced. I wouldn't worry too much about that. I to E ratio. Okay. So you remember that first picture where I showed the, 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 the breath going in, inspiration and expiration? We usually like to get that ratio at about one to two. So in other words, the breath goes in in one second and comes out in maybe two seconds, as an example, if that makes sense. You need to give the patient more time to exhale than to inhale. We can get the breath in pretty quickly, but to get it out, you gotta let it out. Because if you don't, what the ventilator will do is it'll just start trying to stack breaths and then, or if the patient tries to breathe in between, what you'll wind up with is what we call breath stacking or dynamic hyperinflation or auto peep, bad thing. So one to two is a good place to start. Again, I'm getting a little advanced with this. What I would focus you guys on is if you're doing this, FiO2, tidal volume, peep, and then the last thing is your respiratory rate. Now, here's a formula we teach. In the, it's, been, it's taught in the CCAT world, for those of you that have completed that program. Your, so what we're really looking at here is this is your, tidal, your minute ventilation, respiratory rate times tidal volume. But it's even easier than that. Don't worry about, you've already chosen your tidal volume, right? We said six to eight mils per kick. So that doesn't change. What changes is, if you have a CO, so let's say you put the patient on the ventilator and their CO2 is 60, it's high. We want that to be 40, 45. You want to drive that CO2 down. You need more ventilation. The answer is not to go up on the tidal volume. The answer is to increase the respiratory rate. And this is a formula you can copy down to do that. So if you've got an ISTAT, if you've got an arterial blood gas, what you can do is quick calculation and it'll you solve for respiratory rate. That's how it works. So just another tool to have in your disposal. Um, this is where if you're on a long transport, or again, if you guys are, are trying to make adjustments on this, hopefully you'll be doing that. Obviously, we'll be doing that together. You're not gonna leave you on an island doing this, but if you are, this is how you do that. You can use end tidal CO2. The problem with end tidal CO2 is it's gonna be off with these patients because they don't have good lungs. Okay, the normal gap between PaO2, which is your arterial, that's from the sample from your ABG, okay, and your end tidal, which you are all familiar with, is usually around six. It's all usually off by, by a factor of six. But if in a diseased lung, the problem is you have a lot of physiologic dead space. You've got non-participating lung segments. And so you can't use that. You really do have to get an ABG if you can. Fortunately, 
we have a lot of capability to do ABGs. I don't see that as being a limiting factor in our supply chain, honestly. Um, we've got a lot of iStats laying around. They're easy to use, and this is how you can use that, okay? So uh, pressure control, you start with the pressure. You know what? I'm going to skip through this because I really don't think you're going to be if you want to come back and talk about pressure control, we can talk about pressure control. Let's stick with the basic mode of assist control, continuous mechanical ventilation, because that's what you, I think you guys are going to be doing mostly, okay? Um, so one other thing you're going to be tasked with potentially, um, I could see this happening. So what if you suction the patient? So um, we're really not trying to do this with the COVID patients. We do not want to do anything that's going to aerosolize. So we try to limit suctioning. We're not bronching, doing bronchoscopy on these patients. But if you need to, Here's the key, couple things that are important to do. Um, if you suction them, the problem there is you're gonna de-recruit them. In other words, you're gonna evacuate all the air you pumped in them is gonna get sucked out and their lungs are gonna snap shut and they're gonna get what we call atelectasis. And that can be hard to open up in a diseased lung because the lung gets really sticky and if it closes in on itself, you gotta really give it a lot of pressure to open it back up again, okay? But, you know, if they're, Having a mucus plug or something that prevents the air from going in, you have to get rid of it. So suctioning is, is an option. It's not an option sometimes, you have to do it. Just be aware that when you do it, you wanna really try to do this quickly and efficiently and clamp the endotracheal tube when you're taking the ventilator off and you're using your suction catheter in there. As soon as you get it back, try to have, if you can have the situational awareness to do this, clamp that ET tube, okay? Because that keeps the pressure in the lung a little bit more and it can help. That's one of the things we recommend doing when you're, when you're doing suctioning, okay? All right, how do you do a recruitment maneuver? So let's say your patient is desaturating. So maybe you had some trouble getting the airway. Maybe you had a couple shots of that airway before and you had to bag them in between a couple times. Difficult airway, right, okay? All right, well, here's the thing. Once you're established on the ventilator, the best in their desatting still, you can recruit the lung back. So now the lung is all smushed in and you're getting close to atelectasis. One way you can do this is you can just use your bag valve mask, put a peep valve on it. You guys have peep valves or you will. And you can just squeeze the bag and hold it. Hold the pressure in that system. Okay. And you can do this over a course of a couple of long breaths. You guys have all done this. I know you have. You know what I'm talking about here. It's bag valve ventilation. And it's just holding that breath, not releasing it right away, holding it so that you're imparting that pressure to the system. That's what we call a recruit maneuver. We can do it on the ventilator. Again, I'm not gonna go advanced on you. There's lots of ways we can do this. But what we're trying to do is recruit the lungs so that it slowly re-expands a little bit more. And now we get more oxygenation, more alveoli that are open to exchange oxygen, okay? So that's what this is. There, this is you gotta be careful when you do this, they can get hypotensive. But um, this is a technique we talk about. All right, I'm gonna finish up with just some applications for ARDS. Actually, two more quick things. ARDS applications, again, I'll go through this fairly quickly, but just so you know what we're seeing with this COVID stuff, because it is a form of acute respiratory distress syndrome. That's kind of a, a wastebasket term to describe a process where here on the, on the, on the left side of your screen, a normal, um, a normal, Alveoli, exchanges, oxygen across the uh, membrane, no problem. You got surfactant that helps that happen. Take a look at this right here, the type two cell. You hear about this in the media, the type two, you may hear about this in some of the stuff you've read. Um, this is the cell that's getting attacked by COVID, we think, mostly. There's actually the ACE receptor on this cell, the angiotensin converting re enzyme receptor, and that, the. So when the virus comes in here, it's attacking this cell, and then you wind up with the right side of your screen. Profound inflammation, fluid building up in the lungs. The surfactant, which is that layer that helps facilitate nice, smooth lung movement, gone, trashed. The cells are damaged. Tons of happens in ARDS. That's what we're dealing with, okay? You wind up with a couple phases of this. The first part, you'll start, patients will get hypoxemic very much. And this is the exudative phase. Though their compliance, meaning, so what I mean by compliance is volume, the pressure required to, to make a difference in um, the lung volume. Think about blowing up a birthday balloon. 
Some of the thin balloons blow up nice and easy. What if you've got a really thick balloon that you're trying to blow up? And you know, it's hard, it's not compliant. You gotta really put a lot of pressure in to get that thing expanded, right? So that's what we mean by compliance. ARDS is a problem with compliance primarily. One of the major issues that you're dealing with is the lung is now really stiff. It's not nice and compliant, it's stiff. And so if you don't get on top of this, you wind up with a fibroproliferative stage where you wind up with chronic inflammation. And then the whole idea is to just let the lung rest. Don't try to overventilate it. Choose that tidal volume of six to eight mils per kg and let them get to a point where they can recover. If we try to do too much and we try to blow too much air into this really poorly compliant lung, all this stuff on this slide gets exacerbated. What we're trying to do is rest the lung to a minimal level of activity, just enough to keep the patient alive to allow them to recover. The lung is a pretty stupid organ in the sense that, you know, when it gets insulted, it gets really pissed off but then it can recover. And we see this in our, our ECMO unit. I can show you chest x-rays that are completely white, no aeration whatsoever. Three weeks later, ECMO, lung protective ventilation, chest x-ray is normal. The lung can recover. It has a tremendous ability to recover. So that's why this, this whole push for mechanical ventilation is, that's our treatment. That's our treatment piece of this, because if we can do that, then we may get them to the stage where they can recover. We think most of these patients hopefully will if we can treat them as such, okay? This is the histology, exudative phase. You wanna, you wanna prevent this bottom slide. You do not want them to, to reproduce fibroblasts that basically crowd all the cells apart and you wind up with no, no, no ventilation at that point. We do see that sometimes, that can happen. The goal is to rest the lung, let it get back to this, to a normal state, okay? Here's some CTs from COVID patients. What we're seeing is, so this is a cross section. I won't get into CT anatomy. We can do that some other, you got the expert at it, right? You're talking to as your medical director here, okay? But what we're seeing are some of these, you know, basilar, so the base, think of the, think of the low parts of your lung and the back part of your lung. So these patients are laying in bed. The lungs get kind of really junky looking. Um, this honestly, and, and Dr. Rush, please speak up. I mean, um, you know, th this is not um, this is not a horrible looking CT necessarily, but the problem is this only is the tip of the iceberg in terms of the inflammation we see. We wind up with a chest X-ray like this. Just chest X-ray review 101. Black is good, white's bad in the lungs. We want to see a lot of white stuff here, unless it's a pneumothorax. We want to see actually some lung tissue that looks normal. This is a, a patient in fairly late stage COVID-19 disease with profound acute respiratory distress syndrome, okay? Lots of fluid inflammation is causing this horrible picture that you see here, okay? When we talk about protective ventilation, this is the classic slide. So this gets back to pressure and volume. And I'm, I don't wanna confuse you guys. Just think of a balloon, a nice easy to inflate balloon. The problem is we don't wanna overinflate that balloon because then it can pop. We wanna find that happy medium of just enough inflation, just enough deflation. We also don't want the balloon to snap shut. So this right here is a balloon that we're overinflating. See that? Distending, that's the alveoli, they're the balloons. And then we're letting it snap shut because we don't put any back pressure in the system. The, the lung just snaps shut. So you, what we're looking at here is a classic volume pressure curve. You wanna target somewhere in here. So this is lung protective ventilation. You choose that tidal volume that I told you, and now you blow the lung up, but not too much, and you don't let it snap shut. You provide some end expiratory pressure on the ventilator, okay? This is the classic Marty Tobin paper, 2001. This has changed the face of ARDS management. This paper is one of a couple that were really key papers that this concept of protecting the lung. Think of it this way. It's, it's like a way of splinting the lung open. If you're gonna think about this from like a fracture or trauma standpoint, we're splinting the lung open. We're not over distending it, but we don't want it to collapse. We wanna put in just enough pressure in the system to keep that lung from totally collapsing. We're stenting it open. We're splinting the lung, okay? Just to give, I'm gonna go through these quickly. There's an evidence base. So all this stuff about low tidal volumes, it's all evidence-based. In the classic study where they looked at this, they saw almost a, 
an astounding 20%, almost 20% difference in mortality between patients who got really high tidal volumes versus six mils per keg. Lots of things we could talk about with this study, but this is what put this lung protective ventilation stuff on the map. I bring it up because this is going to be the hallmark of what you will do with these COVID patients, what we are doing with them. You want to protect their lung. If they're hypoxic, the answer is not to just jack up their tidal volume and more is better. More is not better. We have to do this smartly by protecting the lung, keeping it stented open. Here is a card that I show for completeness sake. You'll have access to this at the very end here in the files. But the way we do this is, so we, we, we do a little bit of both and we adjust the ventilator, we, we increase the oxygen a little bit. And then we increase the back pressure, the PEEP a little bit. And we do that sequentially de depending on which strategy we take, but you can wind up with fairly high PEEP levels on the ventilator. And the point here is that you don't just open up the oxygen to 100%, you do a little bit of the oxygen and the PEEP. And this is really where you get into that um, this is where you really need to do some hands-on to understand how to use this. But I, what, I wanna, what I wanna impart to you today is there are a lot of resources and cheat sheets for how to manage ARDS. And you guys, just like me, are very goal-directed. I like to be very clear with my team. Here's our plateau pressure goal. Here's our oxygen goal. We're gonna use ARDSnet, and this is what we're gonna do. So I'll literally print this out and talk to my team through this as kind of a crib sheet, okay? Um, think of it as like a briefing card, okay? That's the way we do this. So I'm not gonna go through this, but I just want you to know this exists. You're gonna have access to it. You can Google it. This is how you manage ARDS off this one card. This is literally 75% of ARDS management right here in front of you, okay? 